Wall Street Memes Casino. I'm fine. And Sportsbook. Andrew McCart, IFL TV, and I've got to say I'm delighted again to be joined by Mr. Dan Raphael. Dan, I enjoyed our first interview a few weeks back to talk about the postponement of, of uh, Fury and Usyk. So I thought, why not? I'm nothing else to do on a Sunday evening, well, evening UK time. Uh, why not speak to Mr. Dan Raphael and get his thoughts on two fights that I'm interested in and see if you're interested in them. Um, but first and foremost, mate, how, how's life? How's things? It's good. I mean, I know it's later where you are, but today we're taping this on Sunday. It's Super Bowl Sunday. So uh, when we're done with this, uh, time to go watch some pregame. I'm a 49ers fan. So listen, I hope you can there do you it. Go. I'm a big Christian McCaffrey fan. Do you know what I mean? I really, really like Christian. So I, I have no particular rooting interest in the game. I, I just want to see a good game. I'm a New York Giants fan for my whole life. So that's what I'm uh, they're, they're They haven't been around in the Super Bowl for a while, but uh, we'll sit and we'll watch the game. Got some family in town. Watch the commercials. Watch a good ball game. Watch the halftime show. Yeah, you know it's, it's gonna be fun. Definitely, and the Chiefs are a good side as well with uh, Patrick Mahomes. I do like my American football. I spent a lot of time in the states, but again, that's not the reason why I've got you on here to talk about American <laughs> football. Um, I'll start off because I, I want to talk about Conor Ben and Tank Davis and the, the interest state side in that fight. But we'll put that. We'll leave that to to the end. And I, I want to talk a little bit about Devin Haney and Ryan Garcia. Now, I like Devin Haney. I like what he's done with his career. The fact that he took on a promotional, deal, a promotional deal to go and fight twice in Australia because he wanted to become undisputed. So he had to go and be the B-side, if you want to call it, to get over there and fight Cambosis twice out in Australia. He's came back. He's fought Lomachenko. Somebody's called out over a long period of time. Then he stepped up to fight Regis Progre. And now he's fighting Ryan Garcia. The kid wants to fight, and he loves to fight, and he wants to fight the big names. Um, Ryan Garcia... Um, has he been found out against Javonte Davis, that left hook, being left hook heavy? Um, I don't know if he's still with Derek James. Is that going to make a big difference? I just want to get your initial thoughts on that fight, Dan. Uh, first of all, as far as I know, he's definitely still with Derek James. Mm -hmm. uh, look, it's a good fight because you have two young guys. Both, I mean, look, I know Ryan maybe not considered because of the loss to Tank as the, he's a superstar because of his popularity, maybe not in terms of the accomplishment. But I'll tell you, when I first started talking to Ryan Garcia, covering his career, this is way back, when he signed with Golden Boy, you know, when he might have had like, you know, just a handful of pro fights and uh, I've covered him consistently since. And I remember an early interview I had with him where he told me I'd asked him about, you know, fighting for a world title. I think this was right before he fought against Luke Campbell, which mm -hmm. if you remember, that fight was for an interim title, not for a major title. And uh, Ryan's perspective at the time, and I had never really heard a young fighter say this before, but in essence, what he said was, I want to become famous and make a lot of money. And I'm not really worried about the titles. Mm. Which, okay, I mean, that's totally his prerogative. I just, for me, having covered boxing for a long time, having had interviewed, you know, pretty much all the top fighters for, you know, 20 plus years, had never really heard that. But okay, you're entitled to that. It's your career. So, okay, cool. So when he when he became famous and then against Tank Davis, he made 30 plus million dollars. So he'd become the fame. He'd achieved the fame that he wanted. He had achieved the, the financial security that he wanted. And in his recent time, before he fought against Oscar Duarte in the in the return fight after the loss, he made it a point to tell me that now he wants to become a world champion. And that was important to him, that he'd achieved the fame, he'd achieved the money. And now a title was something that was important because that's where you you make your uh, your name and, and fans and everybody in the sport remembers you by winning a world title. And now this is the opportunity. He had not really done that before. The tank fight was a non-title fight. They did it slightly over the weight. They did not fight for tanks lightweight belt now he's fighting Devin Haney for the, the 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 WBC junior welterweight title and he you know it's not a vacant title it's not like it was one against a nobody uh so I think this is a it's a very interesting matchup I know there was a little bit of a issue there where there was conversation like he wanted Oscar De La Hoya as promoter to go pursue the fight with Haney and they started to do that and then he had a night out in Vegas with Floyd Mayweather who was the promoter for Roley Romero who was sort of uh, gave him his perspective mm. and Ryan uh, kind of agreed with it that maybe it made more sense to go after a title against Romero and maybe set up a unification uh, and they got down the road on that and that didn't happen because Romero ended up taking the matchup for the March 30th you know, pay-per-view that PBC is doing in their first event with Amazon Prime Video so he's gonna fight not Ryan Garcia uh, and that left Ryan you know back to square one Haney he wants to fight the big names also it's a great fight for both guys. Uh, and they were able to, once uh, once the Romero fight was off the table because he's going to go fight Isaac Cruz, the two sides, you know, namely the Golden Boy folks, Oscar 
and uh, Eric Gomez uh, talking with Bill Haney, his, you know, uh, Devin's dad and uh, his trainer, they were able to make a deal in like basically, I don't know, like a week, 10 days. I mean, when you consider magnitude of major fights, the negotiation for Haney against Garcia was really quick and really painless and really drama free, relatively speaking. These guys want to fight each other. And I mean, it's going to be a big talking point in the buildup. They fought six times as amateurs and they're three and three against each other. So that adds even more interest, in my opinion. Definitely. And that, that really, really does add interest. I mean, we, we know the amateur game and the pro group game are two different, totally different sports. Um, but you mentioned there that the, this fight was easy to make. And I get that feeling with the Haney's that they're quite easy to deal with in terms of getting these fights made. Because, I, like I said, I rattled off... Um, Haney's last four or five fights the Kambosis rematch his two fights the Lomachenko fight the Progre fight and now the Ryan Garcia fight it seems like they're quite easy to do business with um, and obviously being that they're both with the zone again that might be a little bit uh, helpful as well the fact they're both on the same network to get this fight done but it's a fight I think the fans are excited about and uh, you mentioned the amateur career but like I said to you there Devin Haney is a totally different fighter than Tank Davis. Tank Davis is one that I think I, I read a quote somewhere, Dan, that he throws the least amount of punches of any active fighter or any world champion right now. He throws about 17 punches around. Um, yeah, listen, Tank is not an active fighter. He can he's mm -hmm. economical when he lands. Mm -hmm. You know, he obviously knocks most of his opponents out, but he does not waste a lot of punches. Devin is a lot different in terms of the activity level. And He'll throw a lot more punches than Tank, but he's not the kind of puncher that Tank Davis is. He's more of a boxer. But he, you know, I, you know, I've always I've said this many times when I've been asked about Devin Haney. No, he's not a big giant puncher. I may be slightly uh, biased from the standpoint that if you go back several fights ago, this is even before he won his first world title in the lightweight division. I was ringside about five feet in front of me because it just happened that we were sort of near that corner where we were in the media section, I, I and he like knocked out Antonio Moran. Oh, with one punch i picked it as the knockout of the year that year that was as devastating a knockout as you'll ever see and mm -hmm. that was one shot from devin haney so i don't accept the fact from people that says that he cannot punch now he has to land squarely and firmly obviously and some guys have better chins than others but when you knock a, a competent professional out like that with one shot that was very impressive so their matchup is very good i mean obviously devin uh, is is the boxer and and Ryan is known more as the puncher given that great left hook he has. They both have good hand speed. They both have good speed overall. Uh, you know, defensively, I think Devin probably would get a little more credit. Uh, but you, you just you cannot take away from the fact that both of these men are willing to step up and fight. It's a risky fight. Uh, I think most people would view it as a more of a risky fight for Garcia. Mm -hmm. You know, he did lose the tank by a knockout. He did get the win coming back and look pretty good in that fight. Um, but while everybody else talks about making big fights and spends half their life on social media, tweeting and, and, and Instagramming and Facebooking, blah, 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 you know, these guys, you know, they do their share of that also. I mean, Ryan Garcia and Tank, I mean, uh, Ryan Garcia and Devin Haney, rather, they, they'll get on their social media and talk shit to everybody and tell you what they want to do. But in the end, they sign contracts and they get in the goddamn ring and they fight. Yeah. And that's what they're doing. Because you mentioned Haney, he's fighting everybody. Two mm -hmm. fights with Cambosis, the fight against Loma. This fight against uh, Ryan Garcia coming up, you know, no problem. You know, let's go. And uh, his father, Bill, you know, it, it's easy to make deals when you have confidence in your fighter. Like he, he's very aware or uh, believes very strongly, as I think many in the public do also, that Haney's going to win these types of fights. Ryan Garcia, you know, he wants the big events also. You know, he's had his differences with Oscar De Loya, his promoter. But one thing that they have in common and I don't know if they've spoken about it specifically or not, but if you go back and look at Oscar's career, now obviously Oscar is way more accomplished than Ryan so far, being all the championships and the Olympic gold medal and things along those lines that Oscar achieved. But one thing that they have in common is they're willing to fight whoever. Oscar fought everybody. Mm -hmm. I mean, you ask Oscar De La Hoya, what are you most proud of in your career? He doesn't tell you it's the gold medal. He doesn't tell you it's winning world titles in six weight classes. He doesn't tell you it's winning 10 world titles. Doesn't tell you about it's the money that he made because he was the biggest name and made the most money of his time. Is that he uh, likes the fact that when you when you talk about Oscar De La Hoya, you have to say he never ducked anybody, fought everybody. Ryan Garcia is taking on that sort of uh, that aura about him. Also, now at some point you have to win some of these big fights. So this will be what I consider Ryan's second really big fight. Uh, you know, at some point you have to win it. But look, I have massive respect for both Haney and Garcia for manning up and taking the fight. When you got a lot of other guys 
in the sport in whatever weight class who just won't do it. And they are doing it. And you mentioned about Bill Haney uh, and making a deal with him. You know, you treat them fair, you treat them right, and they'll make deals. And they've done it really smart because Bill's the trainer, obviously done a great job with Devin, but he's done a great job as the manager also because he's been able to maneuver his son where they haven't had to do long-term deals and they can pick and choose which promoters they want to work with. So, you know, they kind of had to go with the deal with top rank to get the Loma, uh, or rather to get the Cambosis fight. Uh, they went with, uh, you know, they were with Lou DiBella and top rank in a co-promotion. They had three fights on that agreement. They did the two uh, Cambosis fights that made them huge money, mm -hmm. got him the undisputed title, had another big, big pay-per-view pay -per -view payday against, uh, against uh, Lomachenko and then was a free agent and then could look around, went back with Eddie, uh, at Matchroom Boxing, Eddie Hearn, they did the one fight uh, against Regis Progre. Eddie didn't have uh, a long-term contract with him. What he did have was the right to match the next offer. Uh, Eddie did not match the Golden Boy offer for this fight against uh, against uh, Ryan Garcia. And so now he's free once again to go do this fight against Ryan Garcia. Not because he had any kind of bad experience with top rank or bad experience with the Bella or any issues whatsoever with Eddie Hearn, who he has spoken very highly of both in terms of the promotion of the last fight, as well as the promotion of the previous fights that they did back before. So, but he's doing like what Canelo did work with everybody and, and set myself up to get the biggest and the best fights for the most money and the highest amount of, uh, you know, exposure as I can possibly get and, uh, and be on good terms with everybody and do a lot of good business and make a lot of great fights. That's, that's what I like to hear. I, I like when fighters do that as well. It, it, as boxing fans, as media guys, journalists, whatever you want to call us, we want to see the big fights get made. But I, I, I do want to touch on, you mentioned Ryan Garcia's left hook, and I've mentioned Ryan Garcia's left hook. Now, a lot of people will look at Ryan and think, that's Ryan. He's got that left hook, whether it be the left hook to the head or he goes down, but like the Luke Campbell fight, to the body with the left hook. But we saw in the Javonte Davis fight that Javonte Davis is probably one of the best fighters of downloading information. I go to the Leo Santa Cruz fight because Leo Santa Cruz threw a right hand, landed it, threw a second right hand. Javonte blocked it. And he said, <laughs> You can see Javonte saying, Throw it again, I dare you. Throw another right hand. Leo Santa Cruz threw a right hand the third time. He slipped and knocked him out with that beautiful um, left uppercut. So he's one of the best fighters downloading information. That being said, when Ryan Garcia threw that left hook, you seen Tank roll it and it came up. And not, that was the first knockdown and threw his own left hook as he ducked under Ryan's left hook. So, we, D D Derek James, does he have to change Ryan in a sense where he doesn't have to d don't rely on that left hook too often do you think Derek James can get something out of Ryan, something different, something a little bit more to, to go forward with this Devin Haney fight? Well I mean you you know they're going to try to add things to his arsenal and work on certain things but you're not going to you know you're not going to change that, why would you change it? He's got one of the best left hooks in the business, you don't you know you don't go hiding that, you don't put that in your pocket and go to something else, if you're going to go down, go down with your best weapon I mean, I, I remember uh, as an example, I mean, the, the best weapon that Oscar De La Hoya had to go back to Oscar was the left hook. And when he was in a real tough fight against Fernando Vargas, for example, mm. you know, he went down. If he was going to go down, he was going to go down swinging with the left hook. And eventually he got Fernando Vargas with the left hook. So, you know, we know what the weapons are. I mean, you can go through go through the laundry list of uh, great fighters. You know what their number one weapon is. And typically that's what they use, because why wouldn't you? I mean, whether you're a big left hooker or you're an uppercut specialist or you got a great jab or your big right hand, whatever it is. In the case of Ryan. Uh, the left hook is the money maker. So I'm not saying you should rely on it exclusively and tell your opponent the only thing you're going to do is try to throw a left hook and get him out of there. Absolutely, that would be stupid. But to say that you should not utilize it uh, when it's your best weapon and it's kind of gotten to gotten you where you are, you know, what's the old saying? You dance with what brung you. Mm. Uh, and the left hook is what got him to this stage of the game. So yeah, of course, uh, you know, Derek James is a top-notch professional trainer. They're going to, I'm sure, implement things and work on other things, whatever it may be. Uh, in their plan but in the end it's a fight and you use your best weapon in a fight and that's his that's his left hook period definitely and it's uh, again it's one of the fights that i'm really really looking forward to <clears throat> i think boxing right now is booming in terms of getting these big fights made that we all want to see now a fight that's come from left field to use an american terminology um is is corner ben and javante davis now after corner ben i don't know if you saw on twitter dan that after Conor Ben beat Pete Dobson, it seems like every man and his dog was going after him on Twitter. Devin Haney had a pop at him. Javonte Davis had a pop at Conor Ben. I think Earl Spence had a pop at him. Josh Kelly and Michael McKinson, two UK fighters over here in the UK, had a pop at Conor Ben. It just seems like everybody wants a piece of Conor right now. And it seems like the guy that's top of that list right now is Javonte Davis. Now, here in the UK, I think there's a lot of interest in what it, here in the UK as boxing fans. I think Eddie Hearn's made an eight-figure uh, offer 
to send an eight-figure offer to Tank Davis. Now, there's a lot of interest our side, this side of the pond. I just want to get your thoughts on the interest stateside, Javante Davis and Conor Ben. I mean, I certainly don't speak for every American boxing fan, but to me, I mean, I, I can't blame them for trying to get him into the ring. I mean, they're looking to get Conor Ben the biggest possible fight for the biggest money. That is what Eddie Hearn's job is. Mm. And I don't blame him one, uh, I, you know, for a second for doing that. And obviously Conor Ben wants to try to make the biggest fight that he can make also. Uh, I get that. And there's a reason why all those different fighters that you mentioned were having a go at him after the last fight, because he looked just very pedestrian. Mm. Uh, there's no more power. That's clearly no issue. He landed everything, uh, as they say, but the kitchen sink on Dobson and he didn't go anywhere. The uh, same thing in the previous fight that he had down in Mexico, that there was no particular damage done in terms of dropping guys or, you know, cutting him. Or I mean, you know, and the inference from a lot of people is that, you know, you were using PEDs in those giant knockouts you had in previous fights, such as Chris Algeria, Chris Algeri, you were caught and now you're being tested regularly and you're no longer uh, have that kind of strength and that kind of punching power. And so therefore your power is diminished. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. That's just what I think people see when they see a guy score a bunch of knockouts, get busted for PEDs, have a long layoff because of that, come back and do absolutely nothing in the power department in two consecutive fights to go the distance, 12 rounds recently and 10 rounds in the previous fight. So they want a piece of them because they feel like it's probably an easy kind of fight where I'm not worried about getting knocked out. I can take care of this guy. Uh, and, you know, that's their prerogative. As far as the tank fight in particular, I mean, you say an eight-figure payday. I say whoop de do. Tank Davis can make eight figures against anybody. He can probably make eight figures against you or me. So how many eight figures, you know, I don't think, I'm not sure maybe if Eddie said it or not. So, you know, there's obviously a big difference between a $10 million offer and like a $20 million offer, dollar offer or a $30 million offer. I don't know what the number is. 10 and, but, 10 and 15, I think it is. I think Connor mentioned something between 10 and 15. Don't, I think okay. Somewhere. So he made like over 40 for Ryan Garcia. So for Tank, I'm not, don't get me wrong. If you want to hand me 15 mil, I'd be really thrilled to have it. I'm sure you would also. Most people in the world would. But at where Tank Davis is at the moment, he doesn't need or have to worry about getting a $15 million offer from somebody that's not his promoter, not his card, not his country, whatever, uh, to go do it on their event. So I think Eddie's doing what he should be doing, is getting publicity for his fighter. If they can make a deal, great. But I'd be a little surprised if they made that fight because it doesn't really make a lot of sense. They're not in the same weight class. Tank has been fighting at 135 pounds. He fought one time at 140 the Ryan fight was at 136 in terms of the actual contract. And there's a lot of other options he can do in 35 pound weight class at 40. You know, why is he going to go to 47 to fight Connor Ben, who at least in terms of in America is a non-entity in terms of pay-per-view or in terms of selling tickets and that sort of thing. I mean, Connor, when he fought in America was fighting in like, you know, 1500, 2000 seat ballrooms, basically. And again, I'm not, I'm not knocking Connor for that. I mean, if he wants to fight in the UK, he can probably fill up, you know, uh, you know, the O2 arena or some, you know, big, big place there, but not in the United States that, you know, he wouldn't. So I'm not really sure what the, what's the, what's the reason why tank would go for that. Why am I going to fight a much bigger guy for a purse where I can make that or more against whoever and do it on my terms. There's just so many things that don't make sense about it. I mean, if they make it, so be it, but I'm highly skeptical. Most of the PBC guys like that, they roll with PBC. Uh, if there was a true, true mega fight, you know, where they do cross over occasionally, that's one thing. But I don't think anybody considers Tank against Conor Ben to be some kind of mega fight. You know, I guess in the UK it would be a, a very popular uh, fight, but that's pretty much the only place. I mean, so again, I just feel like that is, uh, uh, you know, a lot of conversation. It's interesting. It's kind of fun to talk about. But in the end, I don't think it really has a true chance of happening. And uh, if I'm wrong, so be it. Uh, that was going to be my next one, obviously. Does it does it sell an MGM in Vegas? Does it sell a Madison Square Garden, um, a Tank Davis, Connor Ben? I mean, you know yourself, you know British fans, we do travel. We do like to come along. I, I think there was four British fighters in the Cosmopolitan and, and nearly all of them were, were British, close to half of them at 1,500. That's still a good shout of bringing fans over but again the american audience is what that's well, why fighters come to I'll america put it to you like this when go back to like january of last year when when tank fought near he, he's from baltimore maryland and washington dc is about an hour away by car right down the road same metro market pretty much 
And he fought in Washington, D.C. against Hector Luis Garcia, who was the at the time the WBA's 130-pound champion. He moved up to fight Tank at 135. But nobody knew who he was. He was a non-entity in the promotion in terms of uh, attention or media or having a fan base or anything like that. Good fighter, but just didn't bring anything to the table in terms of the economics. He was just the guy in the other corner. And Tank Davis set the all-time record at the Capital One Arena, a building that is over 20 years old where Mike Tyson had his final official fight. And they broke the all-time gate record for any event there, concerts, sports, whatever, over $5 million. So my point I'm making is if, if Tank fought a Conor Ben, he would sell a shitload of tickets in the United States pretty much wherever they would bring him, but not because of Conor Ben. Maybe there would be some Brits that would make the trip for sure. But largely it would be because uh, because Tank is one of the best ticket sellers in the United States. And it doesn't matter where you put him. You put him in Las Vegas, he sells. Put him in Los Angeles, he has sold. You put him in a place like his hometown, Baltimore, of course, he's going to sell. You bring him to a big time metropolitan uh, city like Washington, D.C., sold there. Uh, he sold out a ton of tickets when he fought in Atlanta. I mean, there are a lot of places where you can bring Tank Davis and he will sell tickets. So he doesn't need a Connor Ben to boost him into the millions of dollars in terms of the gate. So again, I don't know. It doesn't. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. And I don't. I don't know what uh, the interest on on Davis's behalf of that fight in terms of really trying to make it. He just seems like he's got so many other better names that they could go after, either at 135 or 140. <laughs> Excuse me, Dan. But thank the way. Well, I mean, there's talk about Shakur Stevenson, um, Devin Haney. <laughs> that, ain't, that ain't happening. Stop that. That's what I mean. The, the, these fights, Come on. when you mentioned, I, I you, live in the real world, bro. I live in the real world. What, what I'm saying is that they're the names that you mentioned, Tank Davis. You talk to Tank, Tank Davis, they say Shakur Stevenson, Devin Haney, uh, Teofimo Lopez. But realistically, like you said, you live in the real world. So do I. Those fights don't look like they're going to materialize. So for, if you're Tank Davis, where does he go? Like, who can he fight going forward? I mean, that's been, it'll be a year in April since he's fought Ryan Garcia. I know he's had his whatever issues outside of the ring, but that's going to be close to a year now. We're coming into March in a couple of weeks that he's been out of the ring. So where does he go? Who does he fight? I think if you are the Tank Davis team, they'll just take a look down the rankings. Mm. If they, it depends. It depends on what kind of level of a fight. If you mentioned when he comes back, it'll, it'll probably have been about a year out of the ring because certainly uh, PBC is scheduled through March You know, with the uh, Keith Thurman and Tim Zhu fight coming up. I'm not sure what they're planning for April, but I have not heard a single thing about Tank being in that spot necessarily. Their big event in May supposedly will be the next Canelo Alvarez pay-per-view fight. So that would probably push him into June, uh, which again, in today's boxing era, coming off that kind of layup, is not like the, you know, a lot of guys are off even longer than that. So he'll have gone from April till June, not the longest layup ever. Um, if that's in fact when he's going to fight. And, Again, they can look and see what happens in other bouts because, like, for example, if he's not going to fight until June, you know, maybe he can go and try to make a fight with one of these other guys. Like, maybe, maybe, uh, you know, the, the, the Roly Pitbull winner in March might be ready to go in June, for example, and they could have a rematch with either one of those guys. I'm not saying that's the fight that I'm that I want to see. I'm just saying you ask who he could fight. Mm -hmm. Those are two names that would still make, you know, a, an attractive promotion. They were pretty big fights when he fought him the first time, at least in the Pitbull situation. A lot of people thought that Cruz won the fight. You know, I don't think there's really a reason for a Roley rematch, frankly. I mean, he did knock him out pretty decisively in a fight that wasn't all that entertaining, frankly, until the knockout. Uh, but but Tank is going to be uh, the A side, if you will. And I hate using that terminology, but that is the reality. And so they can go and pick and choose who they want to fight. But it ain't going to be Shakur Stevenson. That is That is like less than zero chance of happening. You know, it's highly unlikely to be a Tifimo Lopez. I'm not, don't, don't get me wrong, by the way. I'm not saying these are matches that will never happen. Yeah. I'm saying in the next fight, it's highly unlikely. Tifimo, you know, just fought. Uh, he's talking about whether it will be uh, pushed into reality or not. I have no idea. But talking about coming back within a few months and, was, you know, would like top rank to put a fight on in Honduras, which is where his family is from. That is his background. They've, they've To my knowledge, there's literally never been like any kind of major world title fight in the country of Honduras ever. That would probably be a pretty big deal in that country, but it wouldn't be a Tank Davis kind of fight. Um, you know, Lomachenko is obviously tied up at the moment because he's fighting mm -hmm. against Cambosis. That's, you know, that's a, a whole different story there. So, but the thing about it is Tank can, if he if he wants to ask his people to go try to make the big fights, you don't think that the people at top rank would listen about a T-Female fight or that the winner of, 
of uh, Ryan Garcia uh, against Devin Haney would listen to a possibility of a tank fight? Of course they would. In fact, Devin Haney was asking for a tank before the Davis fight uh, uh, and Garcia was made. And there was apparently no response or interest on their side of things. So, you know what? You don't sit around and wait. You go make the biggest fight you can. And, and Tank, I'm sure, will uh, we'll get back in the ring and fight what will be a big event, whoever it's against. I just don't think it's going to be against Conor Ben. I was just about to say that. Sounds like Conor Ben makes sense now after saying all that. But, um, yeah, it's, it's a different one, difficult one for Tank because when you look Let me at ask Tank, you a question, by the way. Let's, yes. say, let's say, for example, they could make that match between Conor Ben against uh, Tank Davis. What's the weight going to be for that fight? Davis has fought as heavy as 140 for the Barrios fight. Probably and and be, Ben though. struggles to make 147. It'd have to be 147, I'd, I'd imagine, because I don't think I don't think Tank would go up to any higher than 147. I'm not even sure we go to 147. I don't think he's big enough for 147. I mean, Tank Tank is a, a, a phenomenal puncher, and but he he's not blessed with the kind of build that you can see him fighting in the welterweight junior middleweight division down the road while he's still at his peak. Certain fighters, you know, who have the height, who have maybe the you know the shoulder width or the arm length or you know different physical attributes, you can easily see them fighting in heavier weight classes. I mean, I tell you what, when Floyd Mayweather was coming up as a 130 pounder, we all knew that someday he's going to be a welterweight. Mm -hmm. Now, did I think he was going to also go to junior middleweight? You no, know, you didn't really think about that. You know, when Oscar De La Hoya was coming along at, with his height and his reach, and he's winning a world title at 130, unifying titles 135, you're like, he's going to be a superstar welterweight down the road. You know, you look at Tank Davis, you don't think that. He's, he's a small guy, stature-wise. Uh, I'm not sure that that caliber, he's got a dynamic puncher, but does that travel up to 147 pounds? I'm not so sure about that. I know with Saudi Arabia, they 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 sort of chucked their name in the hat for Devin Haney and uh, Tank Davis, but Tank said, listen, chuck me two Ferraris at my front door, or something along them lines. Um, Did you see the response from uh, Turkey Al Sheik? I thought that yeah. was great. I'll give you two gloves. That yeah. Was perfect. Yeah. Definitely. Um, <clears throat> again, I mean, if you, if you want to fight in Saudi Arabia, I would recommend to any boxer, if you want that money, show some respect. Mm, definitely. Well, I echo that as, as, as well, Dan. And it seems like Tank Davis right now, When again, when we look at the, the American boxing, especially me, when I'm looking across the pond and I'm looking at these guys, Tank Davis, Devin Haney, Shakur Stevens, Regis Progre, uh, Richard Hitchens, You've got Subriel Mateus out there, who's, a, who's an absolute monster as well. You, you you mentioned these guys, Rolo Romero, Jermaine Ortiz is there. Um, gosh, I probably missed a few. Lomachenko still, ha he's got he's he's tied up. You want these guys to all fight each other. They, they, some of them have fought each other, but for Tank Davis, I know he's fought Ryan Garcia, but for Tank in particular, I really wanted to see him in, in against somebody like a Devin Haney. Do you know what I mean? would love I, it. Yeah, I think that's the fight, especially stateside, that makes a lot a lot a lot of sense. And... I, I think that that can happen at some point. I mean, first of all, one thing I always try to tell people is you can only fight one person at a time. Mm. I mean, you, you, you know, unless you're doing like a WWE and you're in like a triple threat match or whatever. <laughs> but the bottom line is whatever happened prior to the deal being finalized between Devin Haney and Ryan Garcia, whoever they talked to, whatever negotiations took place, it's irrelevant. They're fighting each other. That's a huge fight. It's not, you know, coming up in April. And now all the other guys, uh, around can go look for their own big fight and, and then the winner of that fight and the loser frankly depending on how they lose will still probably be in the mix or something big and uh and and we just haven't heard tank articulate who he wants to fight what caliber of fight he wants what weight class he wants to fight in i mean let's be honest his biggest fights are really at 140 yes there are still quality guys at 135 but for the biggest fights and the and the legacy fights are at 140. Now they can, you know, I, I, I always love the kid with my, with my man, Leonard Ellerby. Leonard always talks about, you know, making the biggest fights in terms of the money. And that's fine. Obviously he's experienced. He did it with Mayweather for a long time. But one thing I think sometimes some people forget is that before Floyd was making the crazy monster, big giant nine figure paydays and the biggest fights in the world, he was fighting a lot of top guys still making many, many millions of dollars. And he carved out a legacy long before he was making that big mega money. Davis is making a lot of money, but he hasn't carved out that legacy yet. Now, I don't know how important that is for, to him. And I, as they say, you can't take the, uh, the championship belt and go pay your light bill. And that's mm -hmm. fair enough. But I've always maintained that if you take the big fights and you put on a great show, win or lose, you, you keep yourself in the business, you can still go forward and make big fights and the money's going to be there. Uh, so far, you know, Tank has taken... Uh, a path that has put him in a lot of big events 
although not necessarily with a uh, at least publicly anyway the desire to fight the the very very best fighters in his weight class again i don't it's his call i don't blame him for that it's what he wants to do yeah uh, yeah definitely and listen i hope he gets back soon because he's a very exciting fighter and um, i'll end it on this question here then then dan Conor Ben looks like he's going to be staying around 147. Now, we know 147 pound division has always been that sort of marquee division with you've got the olden days with Sugar Ray Leonard, Durans, and all these gay guys. And then you've got Floyd Mayweather's, the Pacquiao's, the Crawford's, the Spences. You've got Boots Ennis, who's a rising star in that division right now. But when you look at the division, can Conor Ben be a force in that division? Can he win a world title at 147? Well, there's a difference between being a force and winning a world title. They're two right. totally different things. Kind of a lot of guys, can, lot, I mean, yeah, if you if you cherry pick against the right guy, a lot of guys can win titles. You know, there's now four available these days, not back. You know, when I was growing up, it was two. Then it became three. Now it's four. So, you know, can he win a belt? Yeah, he can win a belt probably, depending on who he fights. Uh, can he be a force? Uh, I'm not convinced. And, and there's a lot of reasons for that, of which I articulated some of them earlier in terms of the way he performed in the recent two fights. Uh, you know, I don't give him a lot of gr a lot of grief because of the comeback fight. It was off off a long time, 17 months or so. Uh, but I, I've got to be honest, in the, in the Peter Dobson fight, that was just a tremendously disappointing performance. He was fighting a guy that was handpicked. He was fighting, I mean, the other guy was handpicked also, the Mexican fighter he boxed last year. But Dobson has a, had a good pro record, but had never fought a blessed soul had never even fought uh, only but one 10 round fight in his entire career. He was fighting all eight rounders, you know, an older guy, been a pro like 10 years, only had 18 fights. I mean, that was set up on a tee to go in there and blitz the guy. And he never even heard him, it didn't seem like. And he lost some rounds in the middle of the fight. So it, they can talk shit all they want, but you know, it's the performance that I remember, not the shit talk. So to me, you know, Connor still, there's questions to answer about his career. I'm not saying he can't do it. I'm saying that based on the recent performances and the problems he's had with the testing, that I am not convinced that he can be a force, quote unquote, in the welterweight division. Could he win a belt against the right opponent on a given day? Yeah, he probably could. But again, there's a big difference between being a force and winning a belt. Mm. Interesting times. Obviously, right now, like I said to you, I think last time when I spoke to you, the, the boxing right now, we're getting to see the big fights, whether it be stateside, Saudi, UK, and uh, we want to see the best versus the best. And whether that be Conor Ben versus Tank at some stage, who knows? It's an exciting fight. Well, I, hold on, hold on. You say you want to see the best versus the best. I don't think that Tank against against uh, Ben is the best against the best because Ben hasn't done anything to show he's the best. You can quibble with things that Tank has done in terms of his resume, but he is among the best, quote unquote, based on the eye test, based on knocking out the guys, the way he's knocked them out, taking on good names, even if they're not, you know, the elite of his weight class he's certainly a far more established bankable star who's done a lot of stuff he's won legitimate world titles uh whereas connor has nothing to hang his hat on in terms of i mean he hasn't even won the british title he's never won the european title he hasn't won the freaking commonwealth title again i'm not i'm not knocking him i'm just saying let's hold off on saying you know he's one of the best you want to call him a popular attraction fair in the uk uh, I, I cannot go down the road where I can say at this moment, at least not yet, that Conor Ben is among the best because it's just not true. And I think that Conor Ben himself might even acknowledge that because he hasn't had the caliber of victories that you could hang your hat on and say that puts me in a certain level. Go win the European title. You know, go. I mean, and I get it's hard to get the guys done. He's still got to get the licensing situation uh, in the UK squared away. We'll see what happens. They supposedly have a hearing at the end of this month. Uh, but that 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 time will come. So um, I'll quibble with your language very slightly. <laughs> As in, you're more you're more articulate than me, Dan. To be honest, to talk about this <laughs> stuff. So uh, yeah, I still love you, though. No, I love you too. That's why I enjoy. <laughs> listen, that's why I enjoy talking to you because you you know your stuff and and uh, you say your piece. You speak you speak from the heart, which is, which is always good. I might make this a regular Sunday segment if you don't mind. Uh, this is quite interesting because <laughs> there's no boxing on next weekend. Uh, I don't think that's right. Big time boxing, anyway. So well, we got we have uh, next Saturday, at least here in America, in New York, to have the uh, the uh, title defense of Oshaki Foster. That's on Friday right. of uh, next week against uh, my man Abraham Nova at the uh, Madison Square Garden Theater. That's actually a pretty good matchup. I like Oshaki Foster. Yeah, he's a very very good fighter. I've seen him a couple of times, but yeah, again, we oh, listen. It's always a pleasure to speak to you, Dan. You know that. And uh, I, I like the way you talk and the way you just form, formulate things and speak your mind, which is always good. I think boxing fans appreciate that as well. But 
no doubt when something big happens, a news story breaks, I'll probably give you an email and see if you're you're available for another chat. But listen, Dan, as always, pleasure to speak to you, mate, and I'll hopefully catch you in the next one. Andrew, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Dan. Have a good evening. Bye now. Wall Street memes casino. I'm fine. And sportsbook. <laughs> 